The man who attempts to live for others is a dependent. He is a parasite in motive and makes parasites of those he serves. The relationship produces nothing but mutual corruption. What has become obvious to me since joining FTX is that we are more than just the fastest growing crypto company globally. We are a company whose core belief is that people with passion can change the world. Okay, the guy you see next to me is the most generous billionaire in the world, and I found him. Hi, my name is Sam, and this is my story. So who is SBF anyways, and what does his utilitarian approach of effective altruism have to do with any of this? FTX is a centralized cryptocurrency exchange run by CEO Sam Bankman-Fried, or SBF. It's a cryptocurrency exchange. It's a place that you would go to buy and sell Bitcoin and other digital assets. 30-year-old billionaire SBF is a self-proclaimed altruist and co-founder of Alameda Research, a crypto trading firm run by his girlfriend, Caroline Ellison. What happened was, because of some of the collapses, in, in, including Terra Luna, um, Alameda Research lost a lot of money. And being the main owner of both of these companies, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried and, and some of their uh, some of the top uh, executives at, at uh, Alameda and FTX, allegedly we believe this is true, uh, used depositor funds from FTX and funneled them into Alameda Research to prevent it from collapsing. And so they illegally uh, defrauded their investors by using the money from FTX to prop up Alameda Research. And when people discovered that, that's what led to the collapse of FTX. Yeah, absolutely could pull it off without my math degree. <laughs> use very little math. Um, use a lot of like uh, elementary school math, being comfortable with risk is very important. <laughs> um, <laughs> we tend not to have things like stop losses. I think those aren't necessarily a great risk management tool. I'm trying to think of a good example of a trade where I've lost a ton of money. Um, well, I don't know. I probably don't want to go into specifics too much yeah, with that. No, 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 no. <laughs> People realized that there was something very wrong with their uh, assets and some, some missing money. And basically people were saying a hole on their balance sheet of several billion dollars. And once people found that out, everyone lost faith in the FTX exchange. The value of their token collapsed. People started withdrawing their money from the exchange. And pretty soon it became illiquid um, and had to file for bankruptcy. SBF was greatly influenced by Will McCaskill, an Oxford professor of philosophy who is most famous for his work on effective altruism. According to Unheard, in 2012, when Bankman-Fried was still a student at MIT, McCaskill persuaded him that the thing to do, if he really wanted to do good, was to get rich first himself and then improve the world. The amount of good that you can do uh, for the future of the world is, is really large and it's way more than you can do to actually make yourself happy with anything like that amount of money. And he is funding everything you can think of. Global warming. It's one of the biggest problems that we have to tackle together as a world. COVID-19 preparedness. We have to be ready for the next pandemic. Neglected tropical diseases. More than a billion people suffer from them. We have to eliminate these diseases. And of course, animal welfare. Animals deserve to live just like we do. It's also why I'm vegan. He's also one of the largest donors to the Democrat Party, having donated more than $40 million, saying his ceiling was at $1 billion. Before FTX came crashing down due to the alleged illicit activity and crime, SBF was invited to speak to SEC regulators and emphasize the need for more cryptocurrency regulation. So ironically, uh, about two weeks ago, um, SBF was, was part of a debate about the merits of the cryptocurrency regulation that was uh, aired on the, the podcast Bankless. Uh, he and I, I believe the uh, person he was talking with was Eric Voorhees. And they were debating the merits of regulation, and, and Sam Bankman-Fried was in favor of more regulation of the cryptocurrency industry. And part of his um, claim was that, well, look, we, we we need to be able to maintain decentralization, and the the core of cryptocurrency is important. But you know, we need all these regulations in order to protect people, and it's the same kind of thing that a lot of the regulators say. They say, oh, well, you, we markets are so important, but we need a lot of regulations in order to make them work properly. And basically, most of the evidence says that that's not true. Why, why is Ave somehow different than email? So, um, why is it different than email? 
Um, you, you argued so well and so passionately yeah. to not block email with yeah. licensing and KYC. I loved hearing that. Yep. That filled my soul with joy. Such yeah. good arguments. Why yeah. does that not apply to financial transactions? So, um, why does it not apply to financial transactions? Um, I think there are a few things here. So, first of all, okay, to some extent it does, right? Obviously, some of the answers are is that I think there are a lot of ways in which it doesn't, and which I have similar feelings. Like, so I'm, I'm not going to say that there is no similarities there. All I'm going to try and argue is that I think that at least that I feel like that, like, I at the very least feel significantly more strongly about um, payments than I do about uh, about Ave, for instance. Why? And so here's why. And, and again, I, 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 you know, um, so, um, but Bankman Freed was, you know, defending greater regulation in the cryptocurrency industry, and people were speculating at that time uh, that part of his going to D.C. and meeting with the regulators, and especially particular meetings with Gary Gensler of the SEC, who wants to regulate the cryptocurrency industry more and wants the SEC to take a very strong role in that, uh, people had speculated that, well, actually, he's got a personal motive here, that he's trying to build up barriers to protect FTX, to protect his own interests. And that's something that we see all the time is regulatory capture. And it's very normal in the finance industry and, and in other industries as well. For one of the major players to encourage more regulation of the industry because then it protects them against competition from smaller players. You know, the big companies and the big banks in the financial industry, they have teams of lawyers, they're paying millions of dollars already for regulatory compliance. So it's easy for them when there are more and more regulations to deal with those regulations. Whereas small companies and small banks, they have a very hard time dealing with all those regulations. They have a very hard time competing and they have a very uh, hard time starting new banks and new companies and having more innovation in those industries. And so we see this kind of regular regulatory capture. This is a normal thing that happens in a lot of industries. And we shouldn't expect that people that are in the industry calling for more regulation, we shouldn't necessarily believe that their motives are pure, because they're clearly going to benefit from that, possibly at the expense of consumers and other players in the industry. AIER's Peter C. Earle writes, SBF had drawn up and promoted a regulatory plan which, unsurprisingly, favored FTX's business model. The rules he promulgated would have, by one account, given FTX and its subsidiaries a monopoly. It would have also done serious damage to the massive array of decentralized finance and other such firms built over the last few years. SBF's regulatory proposal was so shamelessly self-dealing that it precipitated the entire unraveling of his empire, financial, technological, and political. This whole fiasco has reinvigorated existing calls for more crypto regulation, including from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who said, the federal government, including Congress, needs to move quickly to fill the regulatory gaps the Biden administration has identified. The public right now would benefit from investor protection around uh, these various uh, service providers, if you wish, the exchanges, the lending platforms, and the broker dealers. So we at the SEC are working in each of those three fields, exchanges, lending, and the broker dealers, uh, and talking to industry participants about how to come into compliance or modify some of that compliance. Is it really fair to use the demise of FTX as a way to push the crypto regulation agenda? My big take on it is that I think people outside of the cryptocurrency industry are viewing it a lot differently than ins insiders. Insiders don't seem to think that this is a big deal. And actually, a lot of them are saying this gives them even more faith in the industry as a whole, whereas outsiders are viewing this as something that is an inherent problem with cryptocurrencies 
and saying that the the things that they've always worried about turned out to be true and that the cryptocurrencies are all worthless um, and also is going to cause a major push for more regulation. And so in that sense, I think because people are afraid of it and don't really understand uh, what's happening from the inside, I think that's going to cause potential problems in terms of more regulation, less faith in the industry from from uh, regular people. Uh, Strike, myself, and Bitcoin at large has nothing to do with SBF and FTX. I mean, it's nothing other than absolutely disgusting and malicious crime. In the same way that someone can go hijack a car down the street from my house, that has nothing to do with Bitcoin either. Uh, Unfortunately, it's just an extreme level of criminal activity, crime, and fraud. Uh, However, I think a really important point to make is that the world is finally starting to realize that there's Bitcoin and there's everything else. The way I like to describe the crypto industry and blockchain is it's an arbitrage on the trend. I mean, Bitcoin is, humanity really found its stride in inventing Bitcoin. Money is the most valuable market good we have in any market. It's, It's nucleus to a functioning society. And we made and engineered the best version of it. And the fact that there are other cryptos that have been able to come along and take advantage of the pure desire and need for an invention and technological breakthrough like Bitcoin, and then be able to sell things like Orange Coin and Pink Coin and FTX Coin, which are just vehicles to arbitrage this trend and commit violent levels of crime. It's sad and it's disgusting. It's got to stop. So it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. If anything, it should be a very expensive and expensive and painful lesson of that there's Bitcoin and there's everything else. Yeah, you know, I think most of the people that are calling for more regulation here were people that were already calling for more regulation, and they're just using this as a sort of excuse to say the same thing that they were saying before, even though it really doesn't change anything. And also, like I said, you know, this really wasn't a failure of the cryptocurrency industry. This is a failure of a traditional financial company. Um, and it wasn't even a failure of them making bad investments. It was a failure of them committing fraud, right? Fraud is illegal no matter what kind of regulations we have. And so having more regulations is not going to prevent this problem. In fact, you know, in my opinion, the transparency of the decentralized cryptocurrency industry is the solution to this problem, right? If we were having those cryptocurrency industries all be decentralized, or even for private companies that aren't totally decentralized, they can at least share Um, it's easier to disclose the assets that they're holding. They can allow people to view the the assets that they have in their wallets and and prove to anyone um, that they have those kind of uh, assets and that they're not uh, taking very much risk. And in fact, this is what banks used to do before we had a lot of regulation in the banking system. The banks used to tell everyone what their assets were, tell everyone how much cash that they had on hand so that people would trust them and know that they weren't are ready to fail. Um, and we don't have that anymore because the regulators are saying that they're going to protect us. And obviously, you know, they haven't done a very good job about that. And so I don't really believe that we're likely to get uh, very good regulations here. We have some people, even within the crypto industry, that are saying, this is a t- time for us to get reasonable regulations. We'll, we'll have the regulators that, you know, they'll take the time to figure out what's good and what's not. And that is not how regulation works. Uh, unfortunately, regulators, basically, they almost never do any kind of detailed analysis to figure out what are good regulations and what are bad ones. They just, whatever they think is a good idea at the time, they just do it. They never do very much research. In fact, I, I have a paper that looks at um, about 30 of the, the biggest bank regulations over the last 40 years to see if they do any cost-benefit analysis. And the short answer is they don't. They basically never do any kind of cost-benefit analysis. In some cases, in about five of the 28 or 30 regulations that I looked at, they did claim, we think the benefits of this are going to exceed the costs. But if you go in and read the details, what they actually say is, well, there's, there's no quantitative evidence. We're just making qualitative judgments. In other words, we just feel like this is a good idea. We don't have any measure to say that the benefits are going to be greater than the cost because they say we just can't measure those things. And so we're we're doing something we just feel is going to be good. And anytime you're basing regulations for a multi-trillion dollar industry on someone's feelings, that's probably not a good idea, right? And so that's what they're doing already for the traditional financial system is that they're just making up these regulations. And so the idea that we're gonna get well-informed or carefully researched regulations for the crypto industry, there's just no evidence for that. Let's consider this last note from Peter C. Earle. Not two months before SBF's empire came crashing down, 
Sequoia Capital described SBF as having a savior complex, living his life by a calculus of altruistic impact. As is often the case, beneath a warm patina of virtue signaling and noblesse obligée are decidedly less idealistic machinations, rent-seeking, influence-buying, and greenwash. FTX and its subsidiaries, guided by SBF, had as much to do with building a flourishing future as ESG does with creating a livable planet. As a firm and ideal, respectively, both cultivated high expectations yet generated waste and loss in their wake. For both FTX customers and firms voluntarily suffering under the yoke of ESG compliance, it is probably too late. But more cardboard saints are sure to be anointed. Listen not to their words, nor be swept up by the promises they make, but rather watch what they do. Watch closely with regularity and always follow the money. For as H.L. Mencken wrote, the urge to save humanity is almost always a false face for the urge to rule it. Power is what all messiahs really seek, not the chance to serve. In this back and forth Twitter DM conversation between a Vox reporter and SBF, he was, quote, trying to make sense of what, behind the PR and the charitable donations and the lobbying, Bankman Fried actually believes. You said a lot of stuff about how you wanted to make regulations, just good ones. Was that pretty much just PR too? There's no one really out there making sure good things happen and bad things don't. Usually there's only one toggle, do more or do less. Yeah, just PR. F regulators, they make everything worse. They don't protect customers at all. Or for that matter, other areas that are regulated. The FDA isn't helping. The giant crackdown on big tech has no point or goal or philosophy behind it. OFAC is slowly undermining US interests globally and is the single biggest threat to the US being a superpower. ESG has been perverted beyond recognition. I'm sort of putting together a picture where you don't believe anyone is doing anything for good reasons. You don't believe the good guys are good. So why not make it big and then be the one who gets to decide what good is? And if you have to do sketchy stuff along the way, everyone else is doing it too. And plenty of them are worse and people still like them as long as they win. Is that fair? What we're left with at the end of the day is only the rich can invest, only they can make or lose money. Uh, there's some truth to it, but it's also true that I didn't want to do sketchy stuff. There are huge negative effects from it and I didn't mean to. Each individual decision seemed fine and I didn't realize how big their sum was until the end. You are really good at talking about ethics for someone who kind of saw it all as a game with winners and losers. Yeah, he he, I had to be. It's what reputations are made of to some extent. I feel bad for those who get effed by it, by this dumb game we woke Westerners play where we say all the right shibboleths and so everyone likes us. Perhaps Sam Bankman-Fried's personal sense of morality can be understood through this lens. Nellie Bowles writes in Common Sense, His mom, Barbara, is a major ethicist at Stanford who doesn't believe in free will, personal responsibility, or blame, which is very much the mom you want in this situation. The philosophy of personal responsibility has ruined criminal justice and economic policy. It's time to move past blame, Barbara wrote in the Boston Review. Do you think that all of this will also create a bigger push for CBDCs? So central bank digital currencies that they'll say, this is safe, this is secure, come with us, we'll give you the safe crypto. That is certainly what some politicians and regulators are saying already, is that if the government were running a cryptocurrency, then we could create all of the benefits without any of the costs. Um, and so, you know, of course that seems silly, like really no costs, um, but that's how they try to frame it. The people that are, in favor of a CDC, a CBDC, most of them want, don't want the interaction with the banking system. They want it offered directly to the public. They want something like China's doing where they try to push uh, Americans to only use central bank digital currency, to not use cash, to eliminate the banking system and have the Federal Reserve be managing money directly to the people. And they see that as something you know that would be uh, a benefit for people. Um, 
But of course that would mean the government tracking every single transaction, tracking everything that people are doing. For people that are in favor of big gov government, they want that, right? But for, for most people, most people do not want that, right? They don't want the government tracking everything that they're doing. They don't want all of their, gov all of their information being shared within the government. Um, because we've seen in the past, the government abuse that kind of authority, abuse that kind of information. Certainly in the case of you know, China and other com countries that are trying this, that's part of the government's intent, is to track people and punish people that are doing things that the government doesn't like. And I think that's probably what some of the politicians in the United States want to. They want to track every single individual. They want to be able to punish people for doing things that they don't think those people should be doing that are politically unpopular. Um, and, and for most Americans, I think that is just terrifying, and it should be. I don't understand why you have to be so harsh in your def in your evaluation of those people. Why why call it immoral? Why don't you just say why why don't you say it's a waste of time? Why why pass judgment on me? Because look at the state of the world today. Yeah. And you cannot be harsh enough on those who created it. And those who created it are the philosophers of altruism. It's those who preach self-sacrifice, selflessness, self-abnegation all the anti-self theories which means anti-man all those who demand man's sacrifice they have succeeded and look at the results in the world